in my sales training, I'm always talking about ABC, always be curious. Oh, that's a good ABC. What I mean by that is I want to know about you. I want to know about how you grew up. I want to know about all these other things. And I do it in a way that if I can, draws a little personality from the red, slows the yellow down because they'll talk for hours, allows me to build trust with the greens, and then takes those blues and maybe they're going to give me it to me in 17 spreadsheet with nine point font, but at least I'm drawing them out. They're going to feel like they can trust me on that. So mm-hmm. I'm passionate about it, uh, but I don't overuse it. I have to be cautious that I don't, uh, how do I say this on a podcast politely? I don't anger the Reds. Welcome to Gratitude Geek, the relationship marketing podcast for micropreneurs building genuine lasting relationships with clients, colleagues, and community. I'm your host, Candice Rodardi, and today I'm joined by sales trainer, Kurt Tufert. Kurt is the VP of Sales Development at DXP, a Houston, Texas industrial distributor. DXP is a $1.5 billion public company where Kurt is responsible for developing the sales talent for over 200 outside sales professionals. Kurt is also an adjunct professor at the University of Houston, where he teaches sales. But wait, there's more. He also offers sales coaching and training through his own company, PeakSalesStrategy.com. Welcome, Kurt. Hey, Candace, how are you? And how are all the listeners and viewers doing today? That's one heck of an introduction. <laughs> there's some, we're, if anybody is wondering, we're going to be talking about sales. You think? Yeah, I hope we're going so. we're, we're to talk about sales today. So tell us your story. How did you get to where you are today? Oh, gosh, where I got to where I am today. You know, back in the high school days, I thought I was going to be an oceanographer. And then I got into computer programming. And when I got into college, I went to a fundraiser. And at that fundraiser, I heard a speaker, John Neighbor, seven-time Olympic gold medalist. And I thought, man, I want to be just like this guy. So as soon as it was over, I rushed the stage. I started shaking his hand. I said, hey, John, I want to be just like you. And he said, Kurt, what's your hook? And I said, well, what's a hook? He goes, I have seven Olympic gold medals and corporations will hire me because of what I've done. What do you got? And I said, well, John, I got nothing. And he goes, well, why don't you get a degree in speech communication and find your passion? So in my 20s, I started doing that. And then I just, through the whole power of uh, just being persistent, moved into these areas of sales, sales management, and then started doing a lot more speaking, starting for free and then for fee. And I felt I got a heart of a teacher. So I did a lot of sales, a lot of sales management, which led me into sales training, coaching, and all the development I've been doing today. So you knew from the very start that you wanted to speak on stages, which most people, that scares the bejeebers out of them. So (laughs) what do you think is, what is it about your personality that makes you comfortable with that? Well, gosh, if I'd, if I'd have known back in the day, I was using the disc profiles I am today. So I'm a super high I, super high D, which means I'm an extrovert. I'm that Labrador with my tail wagging all the time. And and that naturally led me to the front of the room. I had absolutely no problem with that. When I got my degree in speech communication, it was just a natural for me. Graduated cum laude from the Cal State University in Northridge, California. So it just, it just fed that, uh, that passion of mine. I know a lot of people who went to Northridge. It's, good school. It's a, it's a good school. I actually, I think I got accepted to that school. Didn't go, but I got accepted there. Um, so, okay. The disc profile is a topic that comes up a lot. And a lot of my listeners know that I can't stand it because I don't like being pegged. I don't like being. Excellent. Excellent. There's so many Candaces out there who don't <laughs> like being labeled. Exactly. I don't like being labeled. So I don't want to talk about that, but good. I do want to talk about when the first time I met you, um, cause I met you through um, many, many years ago and you were never at the front of the stage. You were kind of in the background. You were this silent supporter who was there and you, you, you never overstepped. You, you never did any of the things that would, you know, that people with the D personalities, like I do have a D, I mean, I know I have a D personality. Okay. You never did anything that D personalities would do to like bulldoze your way to the front of the room, right? You were always very supportive from the back of the room. And that is also a special talent, which I think has a lot to do with the reason why you're so successful as a sales trainer. So do you want to unpack that for me? Sure. You know, back when you and I met, it was, there was just a lot going on, launching a new product, launching a new company, 
And I just felt my place at that time was supporting other people to make sure that they shine. Uh, big, big, big proponent of the idea, the product concept, all about gratitude, all about thank you. And I'm absolutely passionate about that. So as I've grown, yeah, I love the spotlight, but I am absolutely willing to give it up to anyone else. Uh, love to pay it forward, love to mentor others so they can get the spotlight. Um, it's just at that particular juncture where you and I were common in with that business, I just knew I wanted other people to rise to the occasion. And boy, you and I met a lot of amazing people in that journey. Our paths crossed. And I think we were better for it because of the people we met. That's true. But the thing, the thing about it is that your um what makes you a good leader is that you let other people lead when it's appropriate. And sure. I think that's the lesson. That's the lesson. Well, yeah, you just summarized it. I have a ability to put too many words in that sentence. So Candace, thank you for <laughs> making it short and sweet. Well, you know, there's my version of it from what I saw from the outside and there's yeah. your version of it from, you know, how, you, what you're thinking. All right. I also want to talk about you being a professor and I, I would like to actually spend a good portion of time talking about your experience teaching college students how to do sales, because I don't think sales was a, t was a course that was available to me when I was in college. Well, you know, Candace, there's over 17 universities that have a formalized education around the topic of sales. Just and, 17. Well, just 17. I mean, <laughs> we're excited that there are 17. When I started so, so long ago, I'm going to call it 20 years ago, the University of Houston had a cutting edge program called the Program for Excellence in Selling, PES. And it was a brainchild of a couple of people who um, launched it. And the idea was we can't offer a degree in sales, but we can offer a certificate. And so they got in as an undergraduate and they took a basic sales course, which allowed them to interview and resume into the program. Once they're accepted, then they would take a sales management course, an advanced sales course, key account selling and they would take about a year and a half's worth of sales training and promote themselves through the selling of a jacket sponsorship, the selling of golf uh, sponsorship for a, a golf tournament. And then we'd have a recruiting fair and they would sell all of the tables and all of that. So they would graduate with whatever their degree was, business, music, uh, fine arts, hotel management, and their certificate in selling providing an employer to say this person has already gone through the trials and the tribulations. So you're getting somebody who is ready and willing to jumpstart their career in sales. This, um, is, this is brilliant because before they could get that certificate, they actually had to do the selling. They, they actually did. And then if you didn't know this, there are sales contests for collegiate colleges. And so we would take two of our best students and they would then compete. And it's almost like the uh, the college basketball. Wait, hold on. Let's start from the beginning on that. <laughs> okay. The collegiate level sales competitions. Yes. Not. Okay. All right. So it it, tell, it tell would originate. It. it would originate in Kennesaw University in Atlanta, Georgia. And 32 of the best and brightest college kids would come to this university and they would attempt to sell a product. So they had 12 minutes to sell this product. So there was a buyer and there was the collegiate seller. 32 went to 16, 16 went to eight, eight went to four, four went to two, and then it was the final bake-off. And the person who won that would be walking through the halls of Kennesaw University with all of this industry just throwing business cards at them saying, look, when you graduate, I want you in pharmaceutical. I want you in life insurance. I want you in construction. And it was just a feeding frenzy. And it's been a joy to be a part. I mean, we sent our kids to that, meaning the kids from the university. And then now in a microcosm, I'm working with Texas A&M and they have not one, not two, three different colleges that have sales programs. The business school under Eli Jones, who came and originated, he created the program for excellence in selling at the University of Houston. So those kids go through a rubric of sales. The industrial distribution program has two sales courses inside their major. And then the agricultural department has three sales courses. So they have their own 
sales contests and they have their own um yeah, ego ego maniacal uh, my my sales instructor is better than yours and it's it's really been amazing where sales has gone as an evolution in in the college of america i've been in sales since i was 18 and nobody ever taught me how to do it and <laughs> and they're in lot that that and you're you're natural people learn from all the bumps and bruises along the way we just give them the opportunity to understand how do you craft a conversation? What words do you use? Why is it better to ask questions and listen and, and then articulate your value proposition and go for the close? It's it's what you learned when you were 18. All right. Let's talk about those questions. What kind of questions open up a potential client to the conversation? One of the questions would be, what would you like to get out of this conversation? Again, everything is different. If I've called you and I've begged for an appointment and you've been begrudgingly said, all right, I'll give you 10 minutes. That's a hostile conversation. And I might say, um, who do you use for your blank? Question number one. What do you like about blank? Question number two. If you ever were to change, what would cause you to change from blank? And ultimately, I'm seeking that third question. But I have to use a technique where I have to ask a question. Who do you use? What do you like about them? So one's neutral, one's positive. And the third question, if you ever were to change, what would cause you to change? And if I've built any trust and rapport, that person might say whatever it is they want to say about why they might want to change. And so many salespeople kick the door down and go, let me tell you about my cabinets. Let me tell you about my paint. Let me tell you about my deodorizer. And they just verbally vomit all over the poor prospect or customer rather than saying, help me to understand, what would you like to get out of this? Uh, have you looked at anybody? What's the ultimate? If you had a whiteboard and money and time wasn't an option and quality, what are you looking for? And you help the other person attempt to paint a picture of what they may or may not like, depending upon what you're selling them. Yeah. And it, there's also a personality factor too. So my husband and I, I mean, you know this, my husband and I had that custom furniture business forever. And we had, uh, you know, in, in the Houston area, you know, it was in the Houston area, we had a plethora of lumber suppliers that we could choose from, but it was personality based. And we did business wherever the particular salesperson that we had the best relationship with went and he moved around a little bit. So we would change lumber companies because it, it was such a commodity item that we could negotiate the price that we wanted to pay as long as the sale, you know, we had the relationship with the sales rep and there was a paint supplier, same story. We were loyal to the, to the sales rep. He never changed companies, but he was an amazing salesperson and we just trusted him to do what he said he was going to do. And we, I mean, we had specialty finishes that we were ordering from him and we just trusted him that he, we were going to get what we wanted because we had a good relationship with him. So talk about that. Talk about the the actual person, the kind of person that you have to be to be successful at sales. You know, the person is successful in sales is the ability to understand not so much the golden rule, but the platinum rule, treat people the way they want to be treated. And so there's a, you know, when I taught at the undergraduate level, we we introduced the thing that you don't want to talk about, which is the whole behavioral <laughs> style. We, we can take it one that. step further in the, um, in the master's program. At the University of Houston, in the graduate program, I used to teach a class on business communication. And we actually issued a book to the students called Social Styles from the Wilson Learning Company. And that's all about how do you business communicate? I, I think... Building that relationship with the person, what you, you could be an introvert and still be a great salesperson if you are focused on the relationship with the person you're talking to. Of course, you can be an extrovert and destroy the relationship by having the wrong personality and coming in too hot and being that suede shoe, pinky ring, plaid jacket. Hey, what's it going to take to get you into that wood today, Candace? Hey, Candace, you know, we, <laughs> you know forget that stuff. We're in, you know, post-pandemic zone here. Everybody is jaded. Everybody is suspect. Everybody's cautious. And the skin is a lot thicker. So we in sales have to be a whole lot more humble and approach customers with our hands open and asking open-ended questions to seek to understand, not to be understood. Yeah. I have been on, I've been in sales and I've also been a buyer. So on the buyer's end, when you're being courted by the sales reps and they're spending hundreds of dollars on whining and dining you and whatnot. Um, I was the gatekeeper for 
the, the particular purchasing department I was in, I was a gatekeeper and I had my own ability to make purchases, but I was the gatekeeper for the, the big money. Right. Right. And, um, it was the, the really super smart salespeople were the ones who wined and dined me, not just him. Right. And, and it, it's so tragic, Candace. <laughs> I talked to a lot of gatekeepers. Well, I don't know what we're going to call it. Let's call them gatekeepers. What we in sales need to understand is if you roll up to a counter and you're talking to somebody behind that counter, they're no longer a receptionist. They're no longer an administrative assistant. They're the gatekeeper. If mm-hmm. you treat them anything less than professional with respect, you won't get to see the big person. Yeah. Because that gatekeeper will walk into that gate to the big person's office and say, this guy treated Michael a jerk. Mm-hmm. If he treated me like a jerk, he's not worthy of our business. Mm-hmm. And so I teach salespeople, I don't care who's in front, if it's the janitor, if it's the mechanic, if it's the guard shack person, you treat them with the utmost respect. Don't talk down to them, be kind to them. And my little secret that I always use is when I'm walking out and I'm taking a client to lunch, and if there is somebody there, I might say, what's the favorite dessert that I'm going to bring you that you promise you're probably not going to eat? Oh, oh, just get me tiramisu (laughs) or just get me tres leches or get me a a cheesecake. And I'll bring that to them because I see you. You're important to me Mm -hmm. because you may be promoted from gatekeeper to the person behind that door. And if you get scorned by me, the salesperson, I've lost all respect and probably won't get the deal. A a really great example is uh, my boss. I'm going to call him my boss. I don't know if that is really the right word for it, but he had um, a bias against a certain, it was a big box. It was a big brand, huge brand. And they were known for uh, something else. And they were trying to break into our niche and they wanted to, and we, we had 30 stores. So we were, we would be a good account, right? So he wanted to, uh, the the sales rep wanted to break into our stores with this brand that was new to our niche, but a huge brand that everybody recognized. And my boss didn't really want to do it because he didn't like, the, he wanted to stick to the traditional core brands in our niche. Mm-hmm. And man, that sales rep, he took me out to lunch. <laughs> he always made sure that I, that I had all the new information. And for two years, that guy came and visited me and showed me all the new stuff. And store by store, I convinced the big guy that we should give this a try. So we started with like three stores and we rolled and then eventually rolled out that brand to, to all the stores because the sales rep knew that if he just convinced me that I would convince the big guy. Wow. So yeah, and I mean, think about it took two years but 30 stores have a good buy, you have pretty good, decent buying power. And he started the right way. He he got a relationship with you. And then he said, hey, let's just try for one store, maybe three stores. Let's just trial mm-hmm. this out. Mm-hmm. If your customers like it, we can expand it. If it's a dead thing, I'll take it back. Simple trial clothes, puppy dog clothes, anything we can do to get a couple of samples in there. Uh, it's very, very common in sales, but you've got to build the right relationship before you can make those recommendations. And those relationships are built on trust and value. Oh, yeah. And then when there were other things to roll out for other departments, it was an easy thing to say, hey, you also need to talk to Sally because Sally is going to be the person who's going to purchase that item. So let me make sure that you know Sally. So let me walk you over here and meet her. And I wouldn't have mm. done any of that if he hadn't taken care of me and uh, and treated me with respect, right? Exactly. You know, so there's you just, you just there is a specific skill set. You're not going to learn all of it in school, but man, it is nice to know that you can learn it in school now. <laughs> it is know? nice to know that. Exactly. And and I love it. I, I, I Just last week, I was at Texas A&M in the agricultural department, and I was both the buyer and the judge uh, for one of their modules. And so the students were all dressed up. Uh, it's always cute to watch those college students dress up because it's never their clothes because they can't afford any of that stuff. <laughs> so they're borrowing that. And someone was selling uh, a marketing uh, software package. Somebody else was selling a type of uh, snake resistant boot. Someone else was was selling something in the ag world that would be more of an injection for their uh, for their cows, and so that they can quickly get through antibiotics. And so, they, and, were and these again, made up products, or were, were they? No. Okay, so Everyone they were one is a legit product, and and I always caution the students: please 
sell something you're either passionate about or it's easy to sell because you certainly are having enough time being nervous and, and you've got to be passionate about that. So it's always creative. Snake, and those Snake bite resistant boots. Well, well, yeah, it's it's a boot that goes up way past your calf, right? And you use them when you're out there clearing things. You're, it's a great hunting boot. And there's a great student. They showed their boot and they brought in another boot. And they said to the buyer, do me a favor. Which of these two boots is the oldest one? And, you know, obviously they picked one that could go, you know, no, that's not it. See, our snake boot has been two and a half years. We wear them every day and they look like they're off the shelf. Wow. And the snake resistant up to your kneecap. And so, you know, people are clearing brush. They're going hunting and, you know, you get bit by a snake. No, you don't because you have this nice boot. It's truly amazing. And they were passionate about it because I asked afterwards, is this legit? He goes, oh, yeah, my dad's taken me hunting since I was seven years old. Okay. So uh, it's wonderful. that is that is the thing that I don't I do not miss about living in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of wildlife. Holy moly. Well, there's a lot of wildlife here in Michigan. I once once saw a turkey in my backyard and I live downtown. So <laughs> turkeys are are your your chances of hitting a turkey with your car are just as great as hitting a deer. That that's not a metaphor for people. It's an actual <laughs> turkey. Okay, okay. So um I was gonna tell you a snake story. Oh, okay. So I'm I'm my dog is in the backyard and she's running all over the backyard and she's pouncing and pouncing and pouncing. And I yelled at the back window, knock him off. And then I noticed why she was doing it. She was going head to head with a snake and the, the brown ones with the, the copperhead. Copperhead. Yeah. yeah. She was going head to head with a snake and she was darting at it and it was darting at her and, and she was chasing it around the backyard until that snake left our yard. You better believe that dog got treats. Yes, Absolutely. <laughs> Thank goodness we're not bit. That would have been another drama. Was, she was, I mean, and then when I realized what she was doing, I was, you know, I didn't want to say anything because I didn't want to distract her. So the last exactly. thing I wanted was my dog to die from a copperhead bite. But man, we don't, we don't have any poisonous snakes here in Michigan. It is so nice. so nice. Totally off topic, but you brought it up with the snake boots. Okay. So what surprised you about what these college students are learning in sales that maybe you didn't think they were going to learn? What surprised me was that they were fully aware that sales is all about building a relationship. And so they so, already knew that. Well, they, they they did, but they didn't know how. Mm. And again, you're talking about people who are technology based. They live on their phones. Everything's text. It's Instagram. It's it's all this immediacy. And when I go, I go, guys, there are five generations in the workforce. So there you are at 24 trying to sell to somebody who's 64. That's four decades between the two of you. You got to learn how to read the room, read the people to understand that that person won't be as technology oriented and they want to have a conversation with you. You just want to text the order. You just want to do these other things. And, and, the, and the students are starting to go. So it's all about the relationship. It's always all about the relationship. But you need to take time to read books, how to win friends and influence people. Um, that's that's when seven habits of highly effective people, old tried and true books that are all about building relationships so that you don't come across as that person who just wants to spew data. So a lot of, uh, there's a lot of talk and a lot of, you know, yeah, I guess talk is the right word going on with that. We need to learn how to sell to the, to the next generation. We need to learn how to talk to them. But you're saying they also need to learn how to talk to us. It's, it's both ways. Absolutely. Somebody who's 30 can talk to somebody who's 30 because they grew up together. They grew up with all of that. But somebody like me, who's trying to talk to somebody in their or in their late 20s, people are jaded. People aren't buying the BS. And so you say, this is my product and this is my price. They'll look you in the eye while they're Googling your part number to determine if they can buy it cheaper somewhere else. No loyalty, not even a filter of professionalism. It's just cutthroat. Yeah. They don't see the value of, I drove all the way over town in the middle of traffic to deliver this quote. And they're like, well, why didn't you just email it to me? <laughs> or this is the classic one. Hi, this is Kurt. I'd like to, uh, hey, Sarah, this is Kurt. Uh, I'd like to see you at three o'clock. Why? Did I do something wrong? This generation doesn't understand the sales call requires belly to belly communication. That They're like, no, I, it's hysterical. How this generation is so, just send it to me, just fax it to me, just text it to me, take a picture of it. 
because they can multitask. Yeah. Whereas other generations are really not seeing the value of the multitask. I was in a sales situation with a a, a father and a son, and we were ch- chatting with the father, and the son's over here on his phone, so I figured he was just texting or whatever, and he pulls up fact sheet on the product that we're talking about. <laughs> I'm like, oh, he's the one that we need to be selling to, not him. <laughs> you know? Well, maybe he's the one that influences the other. Yeah. yeah. So you're right. They are researching it. Um, my daughter researches the candidates. She lives in another state. So she does, um, she votes by mail and uh-huh. she researches all the candidates and looks them all up. You know, does the studying. She, I mean, she, she makes educated voting decisions <laughs> And we vote based on our gut instinct, you know? so based on who we met and liked the best. You know? so, and, and they're jaded. If it's yeah. a voting conversation, is that person really genuine? Are they going to really clean up crime? Yeah. Or is that just a slogan I've heard from my grandfather, my father, everybody in my house has been just harping on the complete mistrust and hypocrisy of politics. And so we're seeing the younger generation, if they are in it, they're in it because of the integrity of the candidate or the belief of the integrity of the candidate. Well, sometimes- I'm old, I'm I'm jaded now. I just don't give a flip anymore. Yeah, well, sometimes there's a narrative that isn't true that people just keep repeating. So the narrative for the neighborhood that I live in is that there's a lot of crime. And I'm telling you, I've lived here for seven years. I don't know what you're talking about. (laughs) It it could be a narrative of fear to vote for me. Yeah. I have no idea what you're talking about, but I haven't seen it. (laughs) I can tell you about the time I lived in Houston and I had two drive-by shootings within six months of, of living in my apartment complex. So I moved, (laughs) you know, but I haven't seen anything like that here. Wow. So, So yeah, sometimes there's a narrative and you just can't, you, they don't do a good enough job. And this is a sale. It's not just it. Politics is, and sales are a lot alike each other. And sometimes people just don't have the messaging right. Agreed. Yeah. Absolutely agree. And the, so let's talk about storytelling because I have been yeah. totally enamored with storytelling. Storytelling is so important in sales. I'm actually listening to a book called Stories That Stick by um, Kendra Hall right now. Have you heard it? Read it? No, I've, I've, I've heard other books. I've read a few books early on in my career about storytelling so you can craft the story. So her premise right now is that the the most important story for a corporation is the founder story mm. and that mm. everybody in the company needs to be able to tell the founder story from their own perspective. And we do, we do a terrible job at Corporate America teaching our employees mission statements, value, vision, and the narrative of the story. Um, yeah. But the it, mission and the mission statement and the value statement are not the same as the founder story. No. The founder story is who built this, right? The two guys in the garage who built Hewlett Packard, mm-hmm. you know, or Mark Benoff, who had this idea to have a cloud-based Salesforce system, just brilliant. When everybody else was computer-based or giant data systems-based, Benioff said, I want to do it on the cloud. And like, Cumulus Cloud? You know, don't know <laughs> what you're talking about. You, you know, one of the big conversations, Candace, we have a lot when we're talking about sales reps who are selling commodity is which of the two sales reps tell a better story. Mm -hmm. I believe that the person who tells a better story that links based on the research they've done on the prospect or the customer they're talking to has the ability to get the price higher, two, three, four, seven percent. But if it's a commoditized thing, it's that storytelling that's woven through the person, whether you're on LinkedIn and understanding who they are or listening to the founder story or seeing it on the website and then weaving that back in like that is just powerful mm-hmm. yeah storytelling is important even so my husband and i used to eat at this really um mediocre restaurant but we went back time and time again because the server was awesome he was a college student he was he was getting his degree in philosophy we knew his whole life story and every time we came in he would grab a chair and he would sit down with us for 2 minutes to talk just 2 minutes and everybody all the other servers in the restaurant it, I, you could tell it annoyed them right so we go to pay for our meal one time and we left him a nice check because we always a, a, a nice tip because we always left him a nice tip because he took the time to to befriend us. Right. And so 
we I overheard as I was turning away to leave, one of the other servers looked at what I tipped and said, you know, did it again or something like that. It's like, okay, well, you could be upset about him getting more tips than you, or you could do what he does. Right. He the learned how to tell he, a story. The fact that he invaded your space, sat down, <laughs> told a story. Mm-hmm. It's it's the simple things. It's and, and and we just fail on so many levels, especially when we're talking about that people to people contact, mm-hmm. whether it's at a Walmart or a big box store or or at a mediocre restaurant, even you know, dining at a high, high dollar steakhouse. It you can get make or break it just based yeah. on you know, if that person is how to put off air or or something of that nature, and they're not making a genuine recommendation. They're not they're not taking in consideration what brought you into our restaurant today. Are you celebrating anything? Um, can I make a couple of recommendations? This pairs well with that. Mm-hmm. You don't get that anymore. And when you get that, your tip could go from you know X percent to X plus percent. Oh yeah. So true story. Just a couple of weeks ago, I was in Orlando. And I was on a, in a business trip. So I, I went with my the my colleagues. We had dinner at a restaurant. And then I was meeting my BFF who lives in Orlando. And she, she lives in Tampa. My BFF was meeting me in Orlando for lunch the next day. But she and her husband came in early because they love to golf. And they wanted to golf at this resort. And so um, they ate dinner at the same restaurant the next night. And I went, oh, my gosh, my the service was fantastic. And she said the service was terrible. Same restaurant different server <laughs> you know and, and if the if the if you're listening to this or watching this and you're in a place of influence where you can take not the lowliest lowest servant but the one who is skin to skin with the customer who makes a decision it's the difference that they make that causes a rave review or a rotten review and sometimes it's out of their control mm-hmm. the kitchen got it wrong it came late or any of that stuff but you're still the mailman delivering the mail and you can do it with a smile on your face and a song in your heart. And that can, that can make a fast recovery. Oh yeah. Yeah. There's so much, I have so many things I want to ask you. All right. Let's just get into disc for a minute. Uh Oh, you said you were going to I know, I know, but there is, okay. Uh, Because I'm a D that is why I don't like the disc or any of those profiles. Like I was having, I had a conversation earlier today with a woman who who went, do you know about the colors, the different colors? I'm a blue. And I'm just like, oh God, it's another one of those assessments. <laughs> you know, but what you feel like you need to put yourself in a, and and I will, I, glad, I gladly say I'm a D, right? I'll, I will dominate and bulldoze my way through whatever needs to happen to get it done. But it's because I cannot stand it when nothing is happening. Like I want stuff to get done, Right. So um, my job is to be more like you and to sit at the back of the room when it's not my turn to be at the front of the room, right? This, my, this, if I learned anything from you, it's that when it's not my turn, I sit at the back of the room, right? So, okay, talk about DISC, talk about why it's important in your opinion, and then sure. talk about how we can use it. Sure. Um, so- so the disc profile for those people who are watching or listening, and, and it's a personality or a behavioral style. It's what we show above the waterline, if you will. It's how you present yourself. And yes, Candace and I are talking about D-I-S-C, dominant. That's that color of red. I call it the whack-a-mole people. There's a problem, bam, solve it. Got another problem, bam, solve it. You want my opinion? Bam, I gave it to you. Might have hurt your feelings, but you asked me and I gave it to you. And then yeah. there's those yellow, which we call the influencers. Those are the Labrador, Golden Retriever, tail wagging people. Love people, love people, love people. Then we've got the, we call it the green, we call it the steadiness. These are the people who are steady, slower pace. And they just get things done. They don't draw a lot of attention to themselves. And they're always just fine. And then there's the blue. And these are conscientious or the analytics and these are the people who are bound by rules, traditions, policy, procedure. And if, for instance, we have people at my company who are very blue, and if I give a 20% tip and I calculate it one penny over, then my expense check gets kicked off because I'm one penny over. And my red comes out and I go, do you realize the time it took for you to find this and call me 
is more on your salary than the one penny you could have just ignored. But if I ignore one penny with all the expense reports, it could tantamount come out to $7 at the end of the year. So seven the whole dollars. Seven whole dollars. So, so the disc profile is for me in sales, my ability to give you a, um, a tool to help you with the platinum rule, treat other people the way they want to be treated. Yeah. Look, we know that Candace, who is the host of this podcast, is red. So be quick, be bright, be gone. Give me what it needs to solve the problem and I'm out of here. And so if I'm talking about the 15 cup holders in my minivan or how I'm going to stuff my turkey with three different herbs, she's just going to slit my throat with a butter knife. She's just not <laughs> excited about that stuff. But I need to understand in sales when I'm connecting with someone I need to articulate my value proposition based on what I can read and understand from a disc profile that I'm aware of. Not everybody's going to have a red, yellow, green, or blue dot on their hard hat, ball cap, or forehead. Yeah. But I know if I'm talking to somebody who's got higher energy, I can eliminate two. If I know somebody who's high priority, I can eliminate two. And I can get a 50-50 chance simply by having a conversation. And I'll, I'll end with this, Candace. In my sales training, I'm always talking about ABC. Always be curious. Oh, that's a good ABC. What I mean by that is I want to know about you. I want to know about how you grew up. I want to know about all these other things. And I do it in a way that if I can, draws a little personality from the red, slows the yellow down because they'll talk for hours, allows me to build trust with the greens, and then takes those blues and maybe they're going to give me it to me in 17 spreadsheet with nine point font, but at least I'm drawing them out. They're going to feel like they can trust me on that. So right. I'm passionate about it, uh, but I don't overuse it. I have to be cautious that I don't, uh, how do I say this on a podcast politely? I don't anger the reds. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, I, I don't think I'm quick to anger, but I do just we're done with this conversation. I, I was in, I was actually in a meeting. I was not leading the meeting, but the meeting was going on too long because people kept talking about the same topic that none of us in that room could fix. And I said twice, none of us in this room can fix this. We need to move on. <laughs> that was Amen when, to the red. You know? Amen to the red. <laughs> I, but I, I want to come, come to the green for a second. One of the most successful business people I have ever met is a green. She's quite, I think, you know, her, she's very quiet. She sits at the back of the room. Nobody knows. No, most of the time people don't know she's there, but she supports and she uh, is excellent yes. at follow-up. She's tenacious, but she does it with grace and kindness. So don't discount the other colors. Never, ever, ever prioritize one over the other. And I teach in the Always Be Curious the art of understanding any kind of Myers-Briggs, Enneagram, DISC is your ability to adapt. It's our job to treat people the way they want to be treated. So therefore, we, the sales pro, have to adapt, read the room. And if I'm talking to that person that you're describing in the back of the room, I want to know all about them. Oh, yeah. they're green. They're never going to make a decision because the book says here that these people can't make it. No. I want to know because they influence, they do make decisions and they can walk right to that person and say, I think you need to talk to Kurt because I think he's got some things you might want to listen to. Mm -hmm. And if I approach them, approach them properly, I'll get the invitation moved. And, and, and I'm thinking I'm only three or four people in the back of the room, uh, Candace, that, that we might know. So I'm just kind of, <laughs> my brain is going a million miles an hour. <laughs> oh, you know who it is. I know. So, so, um, so less, the lessons here. The, I mean, we've full, full, full circle because we started with you in the back of the room, even though I knew that wasn't your personality type. And then the, 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 our mutual friend in the back of the room, who it is her personality type. Sometimes you can move the needle from the back of the room without ever having to be at the front of the room. Mm -hmm. So that's, what, that's the big lesson you bet. from this conversation. All right. What is, aside from the disc profile and, and assessments like that, what is your favorite marketing tool, tip, or technique? ABC. Not, no, not sorry. That I just did that one. I like ABC though. It, it you know, always one. be it, closing. I know. Or always, <laughs> or, or as our friend uh, who wrote a book on appreciation marketing, always be charming would be another one. But I like another cliche. I think I, I, I picked this up in the same circles when you and I swam in the same place. The fortune is in the follow up. 
And mm. I absolutely believe that the holidays are coming up, you know, and so are we sending out a holiday card? Are we writing a note to somebody? Are we putting a post-it note on a colleague's desk? Are we writing an attitude of gratitude note? Are we trying to do a gratitude challenge where we say one nice thing to per one person for 30 days? I believe sales pros fail at the art of follow-up yeah. and because they're afraid they're going to be rejected. They're too busy. They're too darn lazy uh, or they make the excuse. Well, Kurt, I, what you're saying, you want me to write a thank you card? My handwriting looks like, you know, like an elephant. Well, you know what? Technology stack is out there that allows you to do that. I've never in my 20 years of using thank you cards have somebody said, you know, Kurt, I really don't like your card because it looks like it was generated from a computer. Nobody <laughs> says that. They read it to say, is there anything heartfelt in there that would cause appreciation? So always, always be curious. And the fortunes in the follow-up, that's my marketing tip. So I, I don't talk about greeting cards on the show very often, but I am a huge fan of them as well. And uh, is it right here? Please tell me that it's right here. I'm, I've been in the process of going through cards right now to purge them because I have so many. And I came across, I, I already filed it away in my don't throw away pile, but I came across a card that was sent to me by a client who has since passed away. And when I read the message inside that card, I was so moved that I put it in my do not ever throw away pile, right? You know, all these other thank you cards, I can toss, read them and toss, you know, thank thank the universe for them and then let the universe have them back, right? But that one, I'm never going to give up. So you don't know, you do not know what your message is going to, how that message is going to affect somebody that day. And it could be as simple as I really enjoyed spending time with you today. You made me laugh well, harder than I've ever laughed in the last five years. Right. Right. Or, you know, I, you know, I just, that little message might be the thing that just turns that person's day around. Cause they might be having a crappy day when that card arrives, the magic. And there are so many, I mean, Kurt said it, there's so many different companies now who offer greeting card services where you just create the card on the internet and they ship them and send them to you. There's there's companies where they write the card. It looks like handwriting. There's companies that, that you know, use a handwriting font. There's companies that don't do any of that, but they print them, stamp stuff and mail them for you. I mean, there are a lot of options for, for them. And they're but for the most part, they're less expensive than car cards you're going to buy at the Hallmark store or the grocery store. Well, not necessarily the grocery store, but um, so there, there is no excuse not to send a thank you card. None whatsoever. It's it's It could be your differentiator. You know, you can say, if you're not remembered, you'll be dismembered. Meaning, <laughs> you know, there's nothing you do that's remarkable than any other commoditized sales pro on the planet, especially to the jaded generation of the under 35s. Okay, so aside from greeting cards as a follow-up, what are some other follow-ups? What are some other ways to follow up? Well, you can follow up, uh, you know, with not so much a card, but you can do it with a food. You could do it with a gift. You could do it with something that sets people apart. Here I am talking, and, and we do a service where we might uh, repair uh, a customer's piece of rotating equipment. And I always tell the salesperson, you know, whether it's a piece of rotating equipment that's a six, seven, eight thousand dollar repair. That person deserves something, brownie, gift, something. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I rolled up to a um, to an automotive place once, a, a good repair shop, a good repair shop. And I asked, how many repairs do you have per week that are over $2,000? He goes, I have a ton of them. I said, you realize $2,000 is one of your customer's mortgage payments. And he says, what if you were to do something for that customer by at least sending them a thank you gift? And they started doing that. And the loyalty was 250 X. Yeah. They'd come in for a, a chip, a tire rotation, a brake change, a this, a that. And they would go no place else because they felt loved. And, it can't, you know, Mary Kay Ash said it the best. You know, she said there's an invisible sign around everybody's neck that says, make me feel important. And so I'm thinking anything a sales pro can do to make another human being feel important yeah. is a follow up. And whether you use a tech stack, use some kind of an automated service, or you do, you do something crazy, you literally show up with the food or the gift. People just don't do that anymore. Yeah. And there's value to that. And I think if you're listening to this or you're or watching this and you're saying, you know, I used to do that. Yeah, well, you used to. And 
you know, now it's time to maybe dust dust that off and try it again. Try it again. I built an entire business sending sea salt caramels. We sold five, six, seven thousand dollar beds, and I sent sea salt caramels as a thank you gift. We never had to advertise. The best sea salt no, caramels. We we ever. never had to advertise. We just we just uh, got testimonials and photos from the client, and those photos from the client and their testimonials sold to the next client. I never had to advertise. Amen and, to that. And I mean, a, a, a $7,000 bed is not chump change. No. And your profit is, you know, nice. It's healthy, right? Mm-hmm, and, and, mm-hmm. But to anything, whether you're selling a telephone service or selling custom furniture or uh, you're cutting somebody's grass, you just think about other things like calculate the lifetime value of a customer. Yeah. What is the lifetime value of that customer? And once you spend all that energy and time acquiring that customer, you get them mad and they, they fire you. You got to spend all that money all over again, getting them back. Mm-hmm. All right. Carmel, somebody, the clip, salted yeah. sea salt caramel. Yeah. Are the glue that holds relationships together. They were mm-hmm. my favorite gift. I, I, I gave those away more than brownies because for <laughs> some reason, it's the sea salt. It's the magic. It's yeah. the it, it's the bougie thing. I I, I I don't normally have sponsorships on this podcast, but a link to the service that Kurt and I both use to send those sea salt caramels will be in the show notes. <laughs> It'll be your link. It's your podcast. <laughs> oh my gosh! Anyhow, everybody now is thinking, you know, I'm going to gain ten pounds, but. Keep those questions coming. No, this you're, is- not gonna, you're not going to gain 10 pounds. It's your client is going to gain 10 pounds because well, they're going to get the sea salt. Caramels. Everybody's got to test them for poisons. You got it. You got to be that. You got to send them to yourself. There's actually um, a box. We just got a box of sea salt caramels uh, the other day for my husband's birthday from the president of the company. The, the CEO and founder of the company sent my husband sea salt caramels for his birthday. So that means I've sent a lot of sea salt caramels, y'all. That's all that means. <laughs> When the when the founder and CEO of the company that you use to send sea salt caramel sends you sea salt caramels, you know you've sent a lot of sea salt caramels. There you go. <laughs> oh, so funny. Okay, we need to wrap up. Okay. This is your moment of gratitude. Kurt Tufert, for whom or what are you most grateful? You know, for my professional career, I'm most grateful for the mentors that gave me out of the kindness of their heart all of the tips and tricks to allow me to do what I'm doing today. That's that's one area of gratitude. I'm also grateful for the band of brothers that I meet with every Monday morning at seven o'clock and we hold each other accountable. And, you know, as iron sharpens iron, one person sharpens another. It's those things that uh, that I'm absolutely massively grateful for. Thanks for tuning in to Gratitude Geek, the relationship marketing podcast for micropreneurs building genuine lasting relationships with clients, colleagues, and community. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe and leave a review on Audible, iTunes, Good Pods, or your preferred podcast player. Our theme music is Track 14 by Rev Brock and Soul Lily. Make sure to visit gratitudegeek.com for the show notes where you can find links to all the resources we've mentioned, including ways to connect with our guest, Kurt Tufert. I've been your host, Candice Redardi. Stay groovy, my friends. Stay groovy, my friends. Mm-hmm.